Hey, my name is Morena from the DutchFarmer.com and this is Market Gardening in April. In this video, I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step process we use on our farm for transplanting a crop into a bed. I'm going to take you through the process of harvesting, processing and storing a crop. And as last, we're going to plant a couple of tomato beds in the high tunnel. Lots of work to get done, so let's get to it. April is one of the months in which we transplant a lot of crops that we've seeded and started in the nursery. And today we're going to transplant Swiss chard. Although transplanting a crop into a bed is pretty straightforward, there are a couple of things to uh, look out for and a couple of steps to take to ensure your crops will take off rapidly and have the best possible growing conditions to thrive. On our farm we practice something that's called the no dig approach. Essentially with this approach to market gardening we are trying to imitate the way nature functions and keep our soils covered at all times with a form of organic matter, in our case with compost. This has many benefits of which some are feeding the soil food web and the suppression of weeds. But it also makes it super practical for when it comes to transplanting a crop. Unlike old school and more traditional ways of farming where tillage implements behind tractors or on the smaller scale with walk behind tractors and filters are used to loosen up the soil to prepare it for seeding or transplanting. No dig and the applications of compost on the soil surface without incorporating it allows for a completely hassle-free, loose productive layer in which we can easily transplant our crops. Although the initial layer of compost when converting a plot of land into a production area is quite steep, the ongoing maintenance and management of this system is real simple. Through smothering out the existing layer of vegetation and all the weed seeds that have been stored in nature's seed bank, we barely have to weed our farm. This is a great benefit of the no-dig approach to growing annual vegetables. And to maintain the system in terms of fertility, we simply foresee every growing bed with a couple of wheelbarrows of compost and sometimes top off the beds between successions wherever that is needed. Anyways, let me show you our transplanting process. Depending on whether there is a crop in the bed, we first harvest it all out, empty it and clean it up and apply a bit of compost on the surface if needed. This is then raked out to evenly distribute it onto the bed. Once we've done that, we need to mark out the spacing so we know exactly where we have to transplant the crops. For this purpose, you've got three options. You can use a rake with polytubes on it, you can use a bed roller with a dibble system, or you can use something that's called a gritter. When we initially started out, we used both a 75 cm wide rake with polytubing placed at the distances of where the rows will have to come, as well as the bed roller with the dibbles. If you're just starting out and you're starting on a budget, from the previously two mentioned options, I would go for the rake with the polytubings installed on it. It is a simple yet effective approach to mark out the exact spacing of your crops. You simply look at the crop you're going to transplant, you look at the distance they need to be planted at, and you measure this out onto your rake. This is where you will install the polytubing. Once that is done, you carefully walk from one side of the bed to the other, trying to keep the rake as straight as possible on your bed. After that, you will also need to mark out the spacing that is going to come between each individual plant. This is done by going back over your beds, but this time you use the rake in the opposite direction. This way you will know exactly where the crops will have to be planted. Using the rake with the polytubes attached to it is probably the cheapest option you have available, and it definitely gets the job done. Having said that, it's not always really clear and if you have more financial resources to get started, I highly recommend you invest in or create your own gridding. This tool is specifically created to create a grid-like pattern on your beds, clearly showcasing where your transplants will have to come. This is the most efficient tool out there for this specific purpose and highly optimizes the work and reduces the time spent on marking out the spacing of the crops. The particular gridder that we use is made by a neighbor of mine with the exact spacing we grow most of our crops at. You could potentially make this tool yourself, either out of wood or metal, or you can buy it from several tool suppliers worldwide. Anyways, with this tool you make a single pass over a bed and it will instantly tell you and show you very clearly where the transplants will have to come. 
Once that is done, we grab the tray with the translens out of the nursery and push it onto our dibble plate. This will loosen up all the individual transplants allowing us to easily grab each individual plant out of the tray without damaging them. We then lay a seedling at each of the intersections created by either a rake with polytubing or in our case by the gridding. Once that is done it's time to transplant the crops. If you are serious about farming and you want to do this for an extended period of time whilst keeping your physical condition optimal, I highly recommend you do this task following one of the two positions I will show you here. You can either work on your knees with some protective knee pads going from one side to the other or you bend through your legs and you do it sideways. To be honest with you, I do a combination of both depending a bit on how much I need to transplant as well as the other tasks that need to be done on the farm. One particular position I see a lot of farmers holding themselves and even I'm sometimes guilty of, it, of this myself as well is bending over your back and reaching down. I can tell you from experience you want to avoid this position if you care about yourself. By taking a wrong position for too long you're increasing the chances of serious back injuries and I can tell you it is not fun when every movement you make, if that's even possible at all, is in combination with a very intense pain. Although sometimes it can seem like it's more efficient and preferable to bend over, I highly recommend against it. Always try to either work on your knees or bend it through your legs. Then the transplanting itself is pretty straightforward. You grab a plug, put two fingers in the soil, create a little hole, insert the seedling and firmly push it into the ground. Follow this process until all seedlings have been transplanted. Depending on the crops we've just transplanted, in certain cases we need to protect them from either the cold or from insects. Early on in the season we like to protect newly transplanted crops with fleeces. Once this is not necessary anymore, the weather starts to warm up and we are growing crops from the brassica family, so crops like arugula, bok choy, broccoli, etc. We make sure to cover them up immediately after transplanting with an insect netting. If we don't do this, we know that on our specific farm, flea beetles can decimate an entire crop in a matter of a few weeks. At this stage, once we are done with all the transplanting and if necessary, the installation of the fleeces or insect netting, I personally always turn on the irrigation for a while so that the entire area and the newly transplanted crops will settle in nicely and have enough moisture to ensure a good beginning of their growth cycle. From transplanting we head over to harvesting, processing and storing a crop. In this particular case we have a large standing order for our turnips which we sell off in bunches. Unexpectedly we've been experiencing somewhat of crazy warm beginning of spring with weeks on end dry and hot weather. This causes us to have a much larger uh, flea beetle population than we're normally used to at this time of the year. We didn't anticipate on this and where normally we wouldn't have to cover this direct seeded crop at this time of the year with an insect netting, this time we should have. As you can see the activity of the flea beetles has quite a negative effect on the foliage of the turnips. Many holes start to appear on the leaves, ultimately inhibiting the crop to photosynthesize, stressing the plant out and thus also ultimately affect the quality of the root crop. Fortunately for us, we eat all of the crops we grow here on our farm in large quantities on a daily basis and the quality of this particular seeding hasn't been negatively impacted yet. Also, the specific customer that we are selling this crop to couldn't care less for the leaves, but if you would sell this at, let's say, the local farmer's market, you can imagine that it would uh, turn off quite some people. Therefore, it's best to always grow this crop with an insect netting to prevent the flea beetle from munching on one of their favorite plants. Anyways, let's get to harvesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to need to crop out this entire bed, and after that I will clean it up, quickly fix up the drip irrigation and plant these beds with our tomato plants that are currently waiting in the nursery. Again, when harvesting, same as with transplanting or any other task on the farm, it is important to pay attention to the overall position you are holding. When I harvest turnips and most root crops for that matter, I always work on my knees. I start harvesting the individual plants, try to grab similar sized roots of 3 to 5 turnips, depending on the size, point them upwards and then put an elastic around them and lay them behind me or on the bed. As you can see here, I've got a whole bunch of elastics around my fingers. 
This allows me to quickly bunch several roots together without having to grab an elastic every single time out of my pocket. In the beginning it might feel a bit weird, but with time and practice you'll get good at it and the work will start to go pretty fast. There are going to be some turnips that haven't been able to fully mature or develop properly and these will end up to become a good source of nutrition for our chickens and eventually will turn into compost for future uh, crop successions. After finishing up the harvest and creating the bunches, I collect them all into our harvest crates, write down the harvest date, the exact yields I got for each of the beds and the location and move them over to the washing station. Here we clean the crop and make them ready for sale. The process I follow for washing root crops is pretty straightforward. I keep the harvest crates on my right hand side, dip the bunch one time under water, spray off any excess soil and place it to my left until I either finished all of them or the pile becomes too high. During this stage it's important to do a quality control of your crops. You don't want them to be bruised, rotten or damaged by insects. Turnips are a highly profitable crop to grow on our farm, but we are not the only ones liking them. Besides the previously mentioned flea beetle problems with this crop, root maggots are another threat to the overall yields and the final product. As you can see here, we have a root that has been attacked by root maggots. They create small tunnels within the turnip, making it impossible to sell them. The adults of root maggots are small flies that start to be active during late spring and early summer. This is the moment when they start to lay eggs on host plants. These eggs will emerge after a couple of days and the larvae will move their way down into the soil, feeding on the root crops. Since we don't apply any insecticides nor any other organically approved chemicals, which are just as bad, our only line of defense is to keep these crops always covered with insect netting at the moments where the adult flies are mostly active. This in combination with some crop rotation and good soil care management can greatly reduce the population and problems you have from these pests. Going back to the processing, after finishing up the cleaning we place the crops in plastic bins or directly in their final packaging and store them into our cool room. That's the process we follow from harvest to processing. Now let's get back to the high tunnel, clean up the beds, install the drip system and plant some tomatoes. With the beds cleaned up and the drip irrigation installed, it's time to lay out the tomatoes onto the beds. On our farm we grow the tomatoes in very tight spacing with each tomato plant planted at 10 inches or 25 centimeter distance. To lay out the pattern of spacing you can use the techniques I mentioned earlier on in this video. Since I've already planted uh, the beds next to, next to these ones, I have a good indication of where they will have to come. I first lay out all of the pots and on my way back transplant them into the ground. Due to the fact that we are working with no dig style beds, our beds are really easy to get our hands in. Therefore we don't need to use uh, garden trowels or any other tools to make holes for the tomato plants. We simply dig the hole by hand, take the tomato plant out of the pot, softly loosen up some of the roots, place it in the hole and give it a final push. We do this until all of the tomatoes have been planted. We install the drip and turn it on for an hour or so. The tomatoes can now grow on for several weeks before we start pruning them and training them onto our trellis system. If you like this video make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now. If you want more information on market gardening check out our website over at thedutchfarmer.com. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new today and I'll see you in the next one. Have a nice day.